right. Well, how are we doing on participants? We're, we've got 20 people, so why don't we get started? Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Sue Bello, um, and I am the current ISB Executive Committee Chair. Uh, and so this morning, we're going to give you in first our sort of annual general status of ISB, of what we've been up to for the last year, what the EC has been doing, um, hopefully get some input from you all, and then we will finish up with our two career award winners. Um, all right, come on. Well, here's an interesting, there we go. All right, didn't want to advance. Uh, a couple of housekeeping logistics. There is a code of conduct. We expect that everyone will keep to it and be polite and courteous to all of uh, your fellow participants. Um, as I mentioned, this recording, this meeting is going to be recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel later. Uh, for those of you who maybe aren't aware, haven't seen pictures of all of us, I know I am notorious for avoiding pictures. Um, so hi for me actually having my camera on. Uh, this is your current EC, um, though the members with stars, uh, Marianne, Federica, and Perul are the three members who are stepping down um, after this past term of service. So they've all been, Marianne's been with us for six years. Perul and Federica have each been on for three years. We've really appreciated all of their hard work, um, but they are leaving and we are getting three new members. So welcome to Victoria, Sonia, and Peter. We're very excited to have you come join us. Um, and our first EC meeting is in early November. And a big thank you to Harry for uh, being our election officer and monitoring and making sure that our election was properly run. Uh, and then a, a huge thank you to Sabrina. This is the second time we've talked her into running the nominating committee and making sure that we, you know, that we get nominees who are all who are all eligible to run and running through and vetting everything and pulling that all together. Um, it's been a huge help. As I said, we have three outgoing members who uh, we shall miss greatly. Um, but we appreciate that they have been with us, um, all the members of the nominating committee, and then our election officer. Uh, so what does the ISB do and why should you be a member? Well, we work to promote the work of biocurators to try to bring attention to everything we do that really makes science run, that makes data accessible, that does all of the things that we try to do. We promote then also both communication of our work outside of the ISP, outside of the biocurator community, but also <clears throat> promoting communication within, really helping biocurators build networks. See, has somebody run into the same problem before and can we help each other? Um, help to encourage best practices and figure out what is the best practice. Yeah, uh, so there's a lot of both external communication, but also a lot of internal networking. Um, we have a number of different offerings. We have a number of awards, uh, including, as I mentioned, the uh, career awards that we're talking about that we'll hear from today, our winners. Uh, we offer a large number of travel fellowships. We have micro grants. We have exchange fellowships. There's also a discount for publishing in database. Oh, sorry, I don't usually talk this much. Um, and we do a lot to try to foster communication and outreach. Uh, we have our regular newsletter that goes out to everybody who signed up. Um, we have an email list, which you're all welcome to sign up for. Uh, social media, we've been focusing mostly on LinkedIn and Mastodon. Uh, we have been try to bring to attention training opportunities. Uh, we've been working to revamp the website to make sure that the training opportunities that we've collected are all up to date. Um, we post jobs that are sent into us to the Slack, to the website, to the mailing list. We try to make sure everybody knows 
Uh, we have a members directory, although you must be a member to actually access that. Um, and then we have our Slack workspace, uh, which is, I find at least an excellent way to communicate with people. Um, and that is open to anybody. Um, so just a few highlights from the past year. Uh, and this is sort of a number of reports from our various committees. So we have, you know, a financial report. What have we done with the dues that you've paid into us? Uh, an update on our membership, some of the IT for how we're keeping the website, uh, the awards committee, our training and outreach, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and then our an update on the conferences. Uh, so our financial report, um, you know, you can see here what we've taken in and what we spent out, and we did actually spend a bit more than we took in in this uh, period, but we really wanted to support our first conference in India, and so we really put a lot of money into the travel grants to make it possible for more people to get to that meeting. Um, and I think that was a really good use of the, the funds. It's a really good thing. And then we did award a few other awards. Um, and we also had our first ever uh, lifetime achievement tie. So we funded two, two keynote speakers to two different conferences. Uh, briefly on the membership. Uh, over the course of this last year, we've had 208 unique individuals who were members. Uh, the total number of members at any one time fluctuates. Um, and we do have members from around the world. Although the bulk of our members come from Switzerland, the U.S., and the U.K., um, we have seen a really good uptick in the number of members from India um, after the India conference, which was great. Um, and, and most of our members are from academia, uh, with uh, a significant number coming from industry, um, and then uh, our efforts to try to expand across the world and to make sure that, you know, for the inclusion that we are getting people from everywhere we work. Uh, memberships are, it's a yearly membership. You get a notice about a week before it expires. Um, and then you'll get a notice after expiring um, to keep, to try to make sure we're not holding on to data too long to really respect our members' privacy. We actually, if you're not a member for three years, we expunge you from the database. So your data will be gone so that we don't have to worry about holding on to old information. Um, we really are trying to be careful with what information we collect. Um, we don't want to have anything that's going to, you know, have a data breach and have us have problems. Um, we tend not to send emails to members, even though we ask for an email list, uh, an email when you sign up, when you create an account. But that is really to remind you about your membership and to send you the ballots for voting in the various elections. So in the election of the EC, and in the votes on uh, the various awards. But otherwise, general emails are not sent to the members. They're only sent to the ISB distribution list where you signed up for that mailing list to get those emails. Uh, we have revised the membership directory. So there was a membership directory, and then it went away because we were worried about privacy. But so we put the membership directory behind paywall so you have to be a member to access it um, and we have actually revamped the sorts of things that you can put in there to try to create a directory that will help you find other members who can help you if you have a problem who have specific information or work in specific areas and so if you have an account and you haven't gone to look at it in a while if you go into the account information section you can fill in a whole bunch of information and if there's um Anything you think would have been helpful to have there, let us know and we can update it. It's not too difficult. Um, in terms of the awards and grants, and this is where the bulk of the funds that we spent in the past year have gone. Uh, as I mentioned, we really put a lot of travel grants into supporting the India meeting. And so we had five international grants 
and we had five local awards. So we were able to fund 10 people to attend that meeting, which was really great. Um, for the 2025 meeting, um, because this is the first time we're actually having a hybrid meeting, <clears throat> um, we have four in-person and five virtual. So the in-person is uh, a 2,500 Swiss francs and the virtual awards will cover the cost of the virtual registration. So we wanted to support that virtual option. We wanted to, to you know, make the hybrid a success. Um, and we recognize that traveling is really hard and expensive. And so if you can attend virtually and we can make it possible, then we're gonna support that. And just to note that the closing dates for that, uh, applying for that is October 31st. Um, as ha happened with the India one, if we don't give them all away, we may reopen. Uh, and then we have our career awards. We'll be hearing from our early and advanced career awards uh, winners from last year shortly, um, but these are given out every year. Um, and then we have a lifetime achievement award, which is given out every two years. Um, although it's a little off this time because we have two award winners. So we'll be hearing from uh, Sandra at the 2025 meeting. Um, and the next call for nominations will be in 2025. Um, and then we also offer a number of other awards, which frequently nobody applies for. So we'd like to highlight that they exist. So there is an inclusivity award, which we gave away one this year and a micro grant. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, just to highlight our career award winners, we have Victoria Nunez uh, from the University of Padua and Sushma Nathani from Oregon State University, who are our early and advanced career award winners. And when I'm done giving you this part, we'll hear from them a little later in the meeting. Uh, for travel awards, just to show you the uh, actual people who your, uh, your dues went to support, here are all of the travel award winners from the India meeting. Um, as usual, we give preference to students and early career curators where really getting some in-person networking can be critical to your success. Um, and we give preference to applicants from low to middle income countries where travel funds are even more scarce than they are <laughs> for the rest of the world these days. Um, as I mentioned, the deadline for the 2025 meeting is October 31st. Um, and just because we did have some issues with this, the awards are typically paid as reimbursement of costs, uh, where you send us receipts and we give you the money. Um, and that's because there's only a couple of us trying to run these things. And, and we just do not have the ability to try to, we can't plan anybody's travel. We have enough trouble planning our own travel. Um, so, and applications are, I put a link on there, but there, if you go to the website, you'll find under the awards tab, uh, application, the link to the applications. Uh, and again, to highlight our uh, international travel award recipients, and you can see we came from uh, all around the world. So we have Thailand, Brazil, the US, Egypt, and Japan. We really try to make sure that we're fostering the international part at these meetings and bringing in people. Um, but then because travel in India was much less expensive, we did local awards where we um, were able to offer smaller awards to more people um, to really support the ability for more people locally to come to try to build up the network within India and, and really expand our reach there. Uh, and from what I've heard from the people who were able to go, um, this was a great meeting. Everybody had a good time. Everybody was um, very happy to be able to do that. And this was the first time we'd had a meeting in India. So that was great, uh, which sort of leads into our equity, diversity, and inclusion. This desire to make sure that as a society, we are reaching uh, as far as we can. Um, and I know Marianne has had, had some trouble getting participation with the EDI this last few months. Um, this is a committee that's open to anyone within the ISB. So we really rely on you to bring us the issues you're seeing and the problems you're having. 
um, so that we can try to do whatever we can do to be supportive um, and make sure the the ISB itself it is being an inclusive society. Um, so we really need you. We also are going to need from our new EC members a, a new chair uh, as we, Marianne is no longer on the EC. Um, and they are involved in a number of activities. So there's a lot of thought that goes into, and we actually have a new SOP out on um, keeping these issues in mind when you're planning your conference, um, making sure that you've thought about all of the various things that need to happen, that you have the accessibility that you need, that you're thinking about you know, how to make your attendees as comfortable as possible. Um, so there are a whole bunch of suggestions for this to come in. Um, and then we've undertaken review of uh, the pol you know, policies on what data we collect, on how we handle your data. So we've really taken a step back on, on collecting a lot of information because we're like, well, do, do we need this? Should we even be collecting it? And so we really are trying to be um, as mindful and aware as we can be. But anytime you see an issue, you should really feel free to let us know. There is a channel in the Slack that is for EDI um, where, you know, we can monitor and hear your, your voices. Um, in terms of outreach and training, we focused a lot in the last year on improving our interactions with other groups within the biocuration sphere. Um, so I think Charlie added this one, the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration uh, had a meeting at biocuration. Um, we have been talking uh, quite a bit with Elixir and uh, exploring Apicuron, which is a way to get more uh, credit for your curation, both for community curation, and they are starting to look more at, at distinguishing between community curation and professional curation, because um, that was a concern a number of us brought. Uh, we've also had some meetings with the Data Curation Network, which is a, a US-based group of different, primarily based in libraries that are doing a lot of data curation. Um, and we'll get to hear more from them, and you'll get to hear more from them if you come to the 2025 meeting, as Shannon Farrell from there will be a keynote speaker to talk about um, what they're doing and how their network supports curation at various um, institutions around the U.S. So they have different groups that come to them and say, I've got a set of data that needs to be curated, and they get guidelines and standards. Um, so it was a group that seemed like they should really be within the ISB sphere and yet didn't have a lot of connections to us. So we're trying to build that network. Um, and then we had some talks with the Global Biodata Coalition. Um, and I don't know how aware everyone is for this, but they have been more talking with um, the funder side and trying to find the critical resources. And I know at least at, at a number of the projects are that I'm involved with, we've had encouragement from our program officers to get the Global Biodata Coalition stamp, um, but they are looking to have more interaction with curators and they actually have a couple of questions from them for you all to think about later on, but they are also going to be at uh, the 2020, 25, the 2025 conference. Um, so I'll have a chance to talk with them a bit more. Um, and they had a couple questions when we had a meeting with them and I said I would bring it to the ISB community in general. Um, they were wondering about how we have been able to convey the value add of curation to the funders. So how have you shown your funders? What sort of metrics have you tried to dig into? What sort of arguments have you made to your funders to say, this is why funding our database is really important. This is why funding this curation project is really important. This is the value that you're losing if you don't curate. Um, and the other, the flip side of that is 
have you done any measures? Have you gotten any sort of data on what's the value lost for uncuratable data when, you know, the publication doesn't have the information you need or the metadata wasn't collected as the data was collected. And so you can no longer actually curate that data. Um, so they would like us to sort of think about that. And if we have answers, if there's things you've done, if you could get back to uh, us and we can then get back to them. Um, and you can either email the ISB account or you can post it on Slack. Um, I will probably set up a Global Biodata Coalition channel on Slack after this. And we can have some discussions there about how do you make the case to the funders that, that curation is really important and that they should be funding us at a level where we can properly curate and they should be making it clear to the people who are generating the data that this matters and that they can't just let it slide. Um, conferences. So speaking of all of the people who are going to be at conferences, um, Charlie, thank you for putting together a little bit of the history here. So the first annual conference was actually in 2005. So this, the 2025 conference will be 20 years of conferences, but due to the COVID break, not actually 20 conferences. Um, and we normally rotate between Australia, Asia, North and South America, and Europe and Africa. Um, in the past, it's just been Europe, but we really want to, you know, in, in thinking about inclusion and in thinking about building a real global network, we wanted to make sure that we said, no, it's actually for that slice, that third of the world, it should be Europe and Africa. It shouldn't just be Europe. Um, we also offer some micro grants to support small meetings or to um, add more value to a smaller meeting. Um, and so Sabrina and Nicole gave an oboe tutorial at ICPO and they applied for and received a micro grant to um, run some contests and prizes during that to really encourage people to participate. Um, and so that went really well. It seems like they had a, a really good Im impact and they gave us then a write up. We always ask if you get a grant from us, we asked for a little write-up afterwards of how it went, what you did, how it went, so the rest of the, the membership can see what you've done. Um, and just a little bit on our, our lovely successful meeting in India. This was really a, a great experience. Um, that looked like it was a great turnout. Uh, and then our 2025 conference is in Kansas City, Missouri at the Stowers Institute. Um, and just to note that abstract submissions are slated to close on the 31st. Um, and the meeting will be April 5th to 9th <coughs> of next year. And then we'll drum roll our next meeting in 2026. We have a uh, plan to be meeting in Cape Town, South Africa. So this will be the first ISB conference in Africa. We are, the EC at least is very excited. Um, we are very happy that Nicola agreed to chair. Um, we're in the very early stages of planning. I think there will be a, a co-chair eventually. I just wasn't quite sure who yet. Um, but look forward to hearing more about this as the year goes on. Um, and hopefully in 2026, we'll get to see many of you in South Africa. Um, so just to, okay, I'm actually doing well in time. Uh, to sum up uh, some questions, and I've seen a few things pop up in chat, and I'm assuming that Charlie would have told me if anybody had anything, but we can open up I to questions so. now. Sort of what do you hope to see the ISB accomplish in the upcoming year? Really what, are, are there things we aren't doing? Are there things that you really wish we would be doing? Are there things that you like us, that we've done well, that you would like us to continue to do? Um, we can take any questions. If there are any raised hands, I can take a look at the chat now. Ah, yes, Australia, Australia Asia, yeah, it should be. Yeah, it would be good if it could get to New Zealand. I don't know that we've ever gotten 
to Australia or Australasia, um, that whole area. Just Oceania. Yes, that's a better name. Um, but certainly that is the 2027 meeting will be somewhere in that region. So if we could encourage people to start thinking now, hey, do I want to host? Do I want it in my area? That would be great. Uh, Charlie, you have a raised hand. Yeah. So like one of my goals for ISB in the next year is to fill in this picture that we made for the member chart because there was a, well, I, I made this member chart and when I was making it, I was really thinking we're missing a lot of people from a lot of places and, yeah, and not there's... just that, but places where I know people who are working in our field and our, our zone who are there. And, and for example, I looked in the, the Oboe Foundry Slack, which is like a great place for people who are doing a certain kind of biocuration. And there's actually 527 people in that Slack. So let's say there's an attrition and only, you know, an eighth of them are actually active. That's still a lot of people. And a lot of them are involved in ISP, even though their, their activities are parallel. So I'd love to see our community expanding to, to incorporate those people and also, you know, filling in what's, what's going on. I know, I know there are curators, for example, in Mexico that I've collaborated with, like on GitHub, um, I don't know about people who are in Africa for the most part. So the, the fact that we did the conference in India last year really started to build up the network. And you mentioned before, we welcomed Sonia into the, the EC. And I really am excited for her input and how, how she can help us to get into the India region and then around there. I hope we can see the same thing next year with uh, expanding our reach into Africa and understanding what's the community there, what are the things people are working on and, and so on. Yeah, I agree. We we definitely have, because we try to be very open and very low cost, um, I, I think, you know, we have far more people in the ISB Slack than we have ISB members. Um, and that's great for networking, but it would be nice if, if we could encourage a few more to become members. It's, it's not that much every year. Um, and most of the money that you give to us, we give right back in terms of travel funds and grants and micro grants. Um, so we really don't spend much on the society itself. We run a very, very tight budget on our side and just try to really help more people get to the meetings, help more people have communication. Um, so that's great. If there aren't any questions and I'm not Seeing any raised hands, I will stop my share. And I can turn this over to Charlie, who is going to chair the second half. I think you were going to write, you were chairing the second I half. I had asked, I thought somebody volunteered to check the chair of the second half. Okay. Well, I, I can do it. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, well, we, we've got two ISB career awards that were, were given this year. The first one is the early career award. And so to go along with uh, the, the conference of one of these awards, we ask that um, the, the awardees give a talk. And um, well, interestingly, I actually received this award last year and I, I took the opportunity to give a talk on how I became a curator. And uh, I think I'm really excited to see both Victoria and Sushma are going to give a little bit of their stories on how they became curators. Uh, and this is great because this is a place where we can give uh, new new curators, some insight into how people got to these positions. And uh, from, from my position, also from Victoria's position as being someone who won the career award and has now joined the, the executive committee, this is also potentially a way to get people more involved in the society itself. So, um, you know, Victoria's going to present uh, her, her talk is titled My Unexpected Path in Biocreation, Connecting Data, Science, and People. Uh, there's not much more to say about that. Please, Victoria, take it away. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Let me know if everything goes according to plan. Can you see it okay? Yes. Yeah, looks Okay, great then. Well, um, firstly, I want to thank uh, all the ISB, everyone attending the meeting. Thank you so much. I'm deeply honored to be awarded with this uh, um, excellence award. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna minimize this, yes. Um, so yeah, my talk was supposed to be called My Unexpected Path in Biocreation, Connecting Data, Science, and People. But then when I finalized making the presentation, I decided to change the subtitle. And now it's called The How, When, and Why I Became a Biocreator. 
So um, let's start with an easier question. Who am I? I am a bio creator from Argentina. Argentina is in the south of South America and is the home of tango, mate, asado, and football legends, Diego Maradona, Messi, and we are the home of the last uh, World work Cup. So we are keep bragging about it at every chance we get. So this is my chance. Um, but then going back to me, um, how did I get into science and biocreation? When I was finalizing high school, I had to make a decision on what I wanted to do. I was a bit torn between my two passions at the time, uh, language and literature and biology. I ended up choosing biology because I was pretty amazed about evolution and DNA. So I ended up choosing uh, biotechnology and studying biotechnology. I get specialized in genetic and uh, molecular biology. And I was um, lucky enough to be granted a fellowship to conduct my PhD students that was about genetic engineering and molecular biology. So regarding the normal life of a PhD candidate, everything was going into plan with the normal ups and downs. But then COVID hit and my perfectly straight path suffered its first detour uh, because of the lack lab expertise on uh, viruses and molecular tools, we were reached out, we were reached out to uh, develop and produce a COVID-19 testing kit, which I'm proud to say we, we succeeded on it. Uh, and this was a really rewarding experience. We became one of the first testing kits that were produced uh, nationally. Uh, so it proven how fulfilling the tours could be, unexpected, but fulfilling. So then when I, the, the pandemic settled and I went back to my perfectly straight path, I was offered a second chance for a detour. I was offered, offered a position, a possibility to do a secondment at the biocomputing lab in University in Padua. And having learned this experience from uh, detours, I took the chance and I went with it. And this became my first encounter with biocreation. I was, of course, aware of databases. I used databases before, but I never really stopped to think who were the people that were maintaining the databases. I didn't know why creation was a thing. So I went into the secondment to Italy, and uh, the aim of the secondment was to perform the annotation of intrinsically disordered proteins in the disprot database. Coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, the lab was working on a viral protein data set, so it was really a in my alley at the time. Uh, but then when I began to create, I felt drawn into this practice. So in a way you can say I came in for the viruses, but stay around for the biocreation. As the second month ended, my enthusiasm with the field seemed to be pretty evident. So when I came back to Argentina and I finally got my PhD, I was offered a postdoc position at the biocomputing lab uh, to keep on working as disparate biocurator, which this is the position I'm held in until today, of course. And uh, it's been uh, two and a half, around three years now, uh, they have been acting as a disparate biocurator. So now you know about me, let's uh, get around disparate. So disparate is the database of intrinsically disordered proteins and regions. Uh, it's based on manually curated data by professional curators as myself, by, but also by community curators. And it covers experimental evidences about structural and also functional aspects of this disorder and flexible protein. Um, so in this prot, we have um, dedicated entries for each and every one of the proteins that we curate. This is an example of one of our entries. This is regarding cutting beta one, and you can see this is how our entries look like. You can see the general information regarding the protein. And then we have a feature viewer, which is like a condensed view on the information that we curated from this protein. This is a schematic representation of the protein. And this uh, stands for the regions of this protein being um, annotated or described with structural states transitions they might suffer from like, for example, a disorder state to a more ordered state or gaining structure, or even uh, the involvement in different kinds of functions. At the bottom of the entry page, we have every one of the annotations that relates to these features that are here. 
So if we look into one of our annotations into more detail, so you know what we curate and how we do it, this is an example of our one of our function annotations. So you can see that we specify the function terms using gene ontology terms. We also define the fragment or the region of the protein that we are describing to be involved in this function. The evidence codes or the technique that was used um, to assess this uh, evidence, the publication where this information was extracted through, and some statements from the publication that supports uh, this evidence. Uh, in some cases, you can also see that we specify some experimental details there regarding the setup uh, and can provide more information about the evidence. So the thing that I wanted to highlight here is the, the, the use of control vocabularies that we have, how much we try to cross-reference all the external knowledge bases or uh, databases so we can have a standardized annotation and provide the fuller picture that we can in each and every one of our annotations. So coming back to me, what's my role in this prop? As you know, I started as a curator. I still act as a curator, but now since uh, my role has expanded a bit, and now I also act as a reviewer. Um, our annotations have uh, double check marks or validation marks that stands for that the annotations have been reviewed and double checked. So it's, the process is pretty straightforward. Our curators uh, submit their annotations and it gets to us reviewers so we can make sure that the annotation is accurate and is complete. So if it is, they get their validation mark and it's ready for the next release of the database. If it could be uh, more accurate, it could be more complete or whatever, we provide feedback to our curators. We have a really, I have to say, I think, we have a really close relationship with our community curators and we discuss what's the way, best way to curate some things. And we um, end up having really nice annotations of, because of those uh, contributions. So evident, evident, eventually uh, we review and validate uh, everything that has uh, minor changes and are ready for the release. So my contributions also are uh, regarding the revision process, but then also I act as a trainer. For this product, we have a variety of different settings for the trainings. We have online setting courses, but we also do in-person training courses every time we get. And we have also e-learning courses that are available all the time. We have recently updated them. Uh, we have one course that is in English and we have one course that is in Spanish and it's in particularly important for me because it is a way for us to also promote bio-creation in countries like mine that are Spanish speakers. And so it's, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to also uh, outreach the community. Um, this note also, uh, this um, a bit of way of from the, this brought a uh, formal training. This year, we also have in Argentina, a course I was involved in, it was uh, about databases and bio-creation course for Argentinian scientists uh, that focus also in sharing a light into databasing and bio-creation itself. So uh, another way to try to expand a bit on uh, bio-creation tasks. So coming back to me now and uh, something that might interest you all. Um, my latest curation obsession or focus, let's say focus. Um, lately, I've been focusing heavily on keeping this product up to date, which is a much more challenging task than I anticipated. As you know, maintaining an up-to-date database is not only about adding new data, but also involves constant updates to keep existing data aligned with the ever-evolving standards. So for us, um, the key drivers of our latest updates were related to, of course, new relevant data, but also um, external resources or ontologies perform their own updates and we need to uh, align to them. So there are some time that external resources uh, triggers our updates, but then we also have updates that are perform or need to be done because of changes that we do in our creation guidelines or standards. I'm not going to go into how we manage the first three because I guess that all of our resources have to handle the same kind of uh, a task. But I do want to get into the changes in the creation guidelines or standards uh, kind of update 
because this is something that we do to ourselves in a way uh, to improve the quality of the database, but also because it gave me the chance to talk about another of my obsessions or focuses, which is the uh, experimental detail um, information. So I want to share with you this uh, example of an annotation that I frequently share with my lab members to explain why updates are important. Um, this is one of our old annotation-ish, uh, probably for 2018 or something like that. And as you can see, this is an annotation that is about the calcineurin protein that we have on this plot. And this is uh, evidence about how this region of the protein transitions from an unstructured state, a disordered state, to an ordered state, gaining structure. So this annotation of this evidence is gained because of an FRET evidence. This is the publication that it was extracted to from, I'm sorry. And as you can see, this here highlighted in red is um, what we call an ambiguity tag. This was a way that this had a few years ago to, for curators to express that there was some kind of ambiguity in the publication or in the evidence. It could be related to the second of the peptide being different from the wild type, for example, or to some conditions during the experiment that were away from physiological. So they had some kind of ambiguity. As you can see, these annotations provide information, but kind of about the transition, but it's kind of in the middle of providing a full picture. So uh, through an updates, this is how this annotation looks like today. As you can see, it's the same uh, evidence regarding the transition state of this calcineurin protein, uh, uh, again by thread uh, evidence. Um, you can see that now, besides the point that we also added statement or snip from the publication that supports this evidence, we also have the experimental details. So you can see that there are some, evidently, some construct alterations. This means that the, there's something in the peptide sequence. There's a tag related to the purification and a fluorescent dye related to the experiment being a threat. But then you can also see that there's an interacting protein, which is calmodulin-1. And this uh, interaction between calcineurin and calmodulin-1 is the one that uh, triggers the gain of um, structure. This region of the calcineurin protein is folding up on binding. And this is something that is really important for us when we are uh, studying uh, disorder regions or disorder protein. And this also can highlight uh, functions related to calcineurin. So as you can see, uh, using MIADE guidelines, which is minimum information about disorder experiments and at the guidelines that are related to the experimental details, we can provide a way more full picture regarding what's happening to calcineurin. So in this way, uh, re regarding updates, what I think is that updates not only keeps the data compliant with the latest standards, it also allows us to revisit the protein, the information that we have um, and the literature and find new information that we can describe or add, not just because there's new information available, but because we probably we now have uh, new ontologies that we can use so we can curate new information. Uh, and at the end of the day, we are keeping enhancing the user confidence on the data accuracy. So it's a win-win-win situation to me. But of course, there are some, uh, the, the bad side is that updates can be very time and effort consuming. And updates might not be easy to notice are not as flashy as adding new data. What I'm trying to say by this is that we are oftenly emphasizing the size of a database when we are applying for funding, or we are trying as curators to showcase our work, but keeping the information accurate, updated, and well-organized is an enormous task. And oftenly it goes unnoticed, but it's really important to handle. The third thing, and it's really important also, is the fact that the larger the database size is, the harder it is to keep updated. So it's a really hard work to do curation, not just update, but curate and maintain in a database. So if it is such a hard work, why do we do it? Why do we curate? So I've been thinking about this. And I think, of course, everyone has their reasons, but I think this might resume the, the, the three uh, larger reasons. We do it because we want to 
support scientific uh, discovery and the people that work behind it. Also, we want to uh, enable research breakthroughs. So we want new uh, breakthroughs to happen. Um, also, reliable databases uh, are needed to make the data accessible, to have quality data accessible and useful for everyone worldwide. So I think that's also a major thing for us. But then um, this talk and the, the work gave me the opportunity and the chance to think and reflect upon myself and ask myself, why do I create? And I find three reasons also. Um, for once, my own the detail and some my say obsessive character finds its purpose here in this task. Uh, by I also get to explore uh, diverse biological areas and learn continuously, so my scientific self gets uh, really rewarded. And lastly, I used to think I was working on the basics of science when I was studying how viruses replicate their DNA. But now I find myself exploring something that is even more fundamental, how we define things, how we name things. So in a way, I get to question and to explore the language we use to describe biology itself. So I can say, maybe on bottom line, I've realized that biocreation allowed me to combine my two early passions, biology and language, and to contribute to science in an expected but meaningful way. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much. Thank you to the ISB. Thank you for everyone of the members that voted and the members the members that are joining this meeting. I want to also thank my, my peers at the lab, Biocomputing Lab, and especially those that work with me closely in the disparate group. Uh, the manager, Silvio, Damiano, Maricina, Fede has, has been mentoring me, and now it's my peer, Adele, who is our dev and has to put up with me. And of course, the disparate community curator that also has to put up with me. Uh, so I'm really happy to be joining you all in this uh, society. Um, Thank you very much. So program note, we are super ahead of schedule and it is part of the end of the talk that if anyone has some questions, we have plenty of time for that. So you can either raise your hands and we can un unmute yourself or we can unmute you. Or if you'd like to write something in the chat, I can read it out loud. Okay, I, I can start if no one's got one. What is the most difficult record in, in Dispro that you've ever had to curate and why was it so difficult? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. On the top of my head, I can come with, uh, I can come with a couple. <laughs> uh, I think that are, the most challenging are related to the um, experimental details definition. Sometimes we have evidences that kind of um, overlap themselves. In a way, sometimes we say that this is phosphorylated, for example, and has this activity, but when it's not phosphorylated, it has this other activity, and we have to keep those two records without uh, bugging the system because we cannot have evidences that contradict themselves as well. So those kind of things are really uh, challenging. We are trying also by um, improving NIADE standards and guidelines uh, to, to sort this out and to add all the information that we can without making it too crowded and too confusing for the users as well. I think that's the, the main thing. Thanks. Um, I see that Sue's got her hand raised. Yeah, so I figured I would go back to the earlier talk of some of the questions that we had from the Global Biodata Coalition and sort of think about, do you have an idea of what's the most challenging data issues you run into? Are there particular areas where you really wish researchers would do something different to make it a little easier? Are there areas where you, you know, think if you had a little more collaboration, you might find things run smoother? Uh, I don't know if th this is what you mean, but, um... Regarding um, researchers, I think the major thing for me that my 90% of my time is uh, reading publication and curating, really, whether I'm reviewing or curating. Uh, I think that we, we 
kind of need to standardize the way that we report uh, results and experiment that we are performing in a way that is more easy to access. There are some times that we, I don't know if this happens to any of you, but we go into a rabbit hole just to create one piece of information and we end up going and going and going and we never get the, the, the bottom of easy and basic information like what protein are you trying to give information about? So that's what one thing I can come up with on the top of my head right now. Um, I don't know if that's what you were referring to. Yeah, that, that's what I think about it. Yeah. And <laughs> I certainly know that rabbit hole is you chase paper to paper to paper to try to figure out yeah. what, what exactly are they actually talking about? Definitely. <laughs> also for us, I'm sorry, I just want to expand on this. For us, it's a bit tricky also. Sometimes we are trying to define also new ontologies for us because we are a particular database that not only define proteins as them, themselves, but define regions within protein. And this seems trivial maybe, but for example, gene ontology define proteins or genes functions for the whole thing. And for us, those, those things, maybe uh, we go into a bit of a philosophical discussion, but uh, sometimes those terms don't really apply to us because we are not describing the whole, but just a region. So that's also something that for us is tricky, but we are working on new ontologies for us also. Yeah, I, I think before I got into curation, I never thought how much some basic logic courses were going to come into play as you try to correctly build an ontology that makes sense both logically and biologically. Yeah, definitely. But I, I find myself to be fond of that that chaos. Okay. It, I don't think there's any other hands raised or questions in the chat. So let's all one more time thank Victoria for her great talk and congratulate her on her award. Uh, and thank we're excited so to have you in the EC and to, to get all of your interesting ideas and input in the society. <laughs> thank you so much. So um, our, our second talk is for the Advanced Career Award. And this would be given by Sushma, uh, also along similar lines. And I'm sorry, but I seem to have lost where I had the the slides. And so I forgot what the title was. <laughs> Maybe you can help I, me out. So I'm, I, I'm take... going to share it. Uh, just All right. Minute. So yeah, congratulations. And uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. And let me, OK. Can you see my slides properly? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. So I'm just going to speak about my journey as a bio curator. And so uh, I'm Sushma Nathani and I'm at Oregon State University. Uh, so I had a very long life as an experimental scientist and uh, relatively half of my career then transitioned towards the bio curation. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about my journey. So I come from a very small region in the Himalayan region and, you know, in the India, very, very north, very close to Nepal. And this is the kind of the picture from my ancestral village that you see at the bottom. So I, I come from this very little, small hilly, hilly region. Uh, so my, sorry. Okay. So who am I now? So many of you who see me on the Zoom might think I'm some person like this uh, who appears on the Zoom and claims to be a plant scientist. So that has been my very recent life uh, for many, many years, including the pandemic time. And uh, through my story, I hope to convey that science careers can evolve with landscape of changing technology. And especially these days, we think about the biocurators and the future of the uh, biocuration uh, with the emerging AI. And so I just wanted to see in retrospect how I evolved as a biocurator. 
So I began my journey as a PhD student in National Botanical Research Institute in India. I joined as a PhD student in 1992, and I worked on sequencing of plastid genes. So at that time, we used those uh, Sanger sequencing method and saw the uh, radioactive images of uh, tagged nucleotide with the radioactivity and read things manually. And then within two or three years, we shifted to uh, another technology. And so that was like the more fluorescent dye-based technology. And uh, we went to the AB373 uh, and then 473. So these are kind of the ancient tale of how the sequencing technology itself changed uh, within two or three years uh, when I was a PhD student. So I spent a lot of time sequencing genes and looking their expression and, you know, cloning and doing all kinds of things, uh, mapping and so on. And so I finished my PhD and then I moved for uh, a little bit time while I submitted my PhD, but not awarded to Iowa State University in Dr. Parag Chitnis's lab at Iowa State University. And he was working with maize and he was working also with the Cyanobacteria synecosystis PCC6803. So there was something great about this model system. It is a unicellular cyanobacteria that is able to do photosynthesis. So it is an autotroph. And at that time, it was one of the uh, unique uh, organism where the whole genome sequence was known, about 3,000 genes, and it was possible to knock out each genes and study the function. So I worked on two projects. So one project was looking for the biosynthesis pathway for phyloquinone. So some of you who are not plant scientists, so phyloquinone is an electron acceptor in the photosystem one. And uh, phyloquinone is also uh, known as vitamin K. And so there are naturally two forms of vitamin K. One is menaquinone that is synthesized in bacteria like E. coli, and then phyloquinone that is in the green plants and cyanobacteria. And so we, so that pathway was not known, but there were some genes that were identified in E. coli for the menaquinone biosynthesis pathway. So with the, some effort, you know, with a very low sequence similarity, we were able to predict which could be the likely genes. And then we started knocking those out. And with the other lab members, uh, I contributed in identifying two of the genes of these pathways. And then, you know, uh, once we had the knockout mutants, uh, this cyanobacteria is not able to do photosynthesis, but it can grow in the sugar medium. And then we were able to also test that absence of phyloquinone and tie that, yes, this is the pathway and we are missing the final molecule and so on. So then from the sequencing, I kind of jumped into sequencing, cloning, plus also uh, functional characterization of the genes and pathways. After that, I moved to uh, an, another project also in the same lab, and that was about looking into the function of the various uh, proteins that are associated with the photosystem one complex. And so I looked into PSA K1, K2, and PSA M gene and knocked those out and looked their effect on the photosynthesis. So these are three uh, peripheral subunits of photosystem one. And, you know, I eventually characterized their effect on photosynthesis uh, in the stoichiometry of PS1 and PS2, and uh, one of the findings that we had in cyanobacteria, we have two genes that encode for PSA K subunit, K1 and K2, and in higher plants, we have only K, uh, only one gene. So previous to my paper, uh, only PSA K1 has been identified in the gels and at the level of the protein. For the first time, I identified that PSAK2 is also expressed as a protein, and later studies proved that it is essential for survival of cyanobacteria in high light intensity. Uh, this study was also crucial in refining the crystal structure of the photosystem one. And so uh, our, some of our findings were not consistent uh, with the previously reported uh, crystal structure of 
uh, photo system one, but the new one that came uh, was very, very much aligned with our studies. So, so this was great to learn about photo system and doing the knockouts uh, and testing the hypothesis and adding to some of the basic new knowledge. From uh, Paranjitnis's lab, when I was working, uh, of course, you know, bacterial genomes were sequenced and were coming one after another. Uh, but then uh, in 1997, also the full sequence of the East genome came. And in 2000, we know that the Human Genome Project uh, also led to the Human Genome Sequence publication. So this was a time when the genetics and the single gen gene and pathway things started moving into the whole genome uh, and start of the genomics and uh, transcriptomic studies. So uh, from Prague Chitnis's lab, after one and a half year, I moved to Cornell as a postdoc in Tom Fox's lab, and I started working on East. Uh, so in Tom's lab, uh, I learned few things. First of thing, you can see we started coding our plates. So we had many different type of the media that we used for characterizing East mutants. And we worked on the mitochondrial biogenesis. And so this was, I, you can think about my first training in coding. And Tom had a very great database in the FileMaker for uh, documenting each strain or the plasmid. And we had, you know, kind of the data organization strain, where it is kept, if, if it was published by the previous members or somebody else, so all that kind of uh, thing. So uh, this is where I actually started appreciating organizing the data and when you have the large collections of the strains and things like that. Uh, also in Tom's lab, we, uh, I was uh, trained to look into the East uh, database SGD and also IPD. So, so this was my first introduction to the databases and data organization in very much detail. Of course, uh, you know, I published uh, a paper with Tom, and here also I looked into uh, role of uh, three, uh, role of the various translational uh, activators uh, in biogenesis of cyto cytochrome C oxidase complex in mitochondria that plays a role in respiration. So I moved from chloroplast biology and photosystem photos, or photosynthesis into the respiration. So my earlier life was on organelle biogenesis and related to chloroplast and mitochondria. And it was a great thing, uh, you know, using these systems and learning more genetics and more functional, uh, functional characterization of genes. Uh, also, while working in Tom's lab, I also understood the importance of gene-gene uh, interactions and how many different type of the interactions can happen between the genes, genes and proteins, uh, proteins and uh, RNA, and I, I learned many useful techniques. So this was uh, about uh, 2002 and so, and I was keen to return to India and find a job as a plant biologist. So I was applying and I also switched in that interest again back to the plant biology. And I joined Professor June Nasrallah's lab again at Cornell, and I did my second postdoc. So uh, here I studied uh, a great system, uh, June uh, has developed to study the self-incompatibility in Brassica. So I took all my East tools from Tom's lab, uh, East to hybrid, uh, East surface display. I learned additional, uh, you know, the protein uh, modeling and so on. And I studied the SRK receptor kinase. And this study led to the first report in plants uh, that uh, the plant receptors are able to dimerize without binding the ligands. And it had many uh, important uh, uh, consequences for understanding the cell signaling in plants. Later on, many other studies followed. But before that, uh, the dominant model was EGF and EGFR, uh, where uh, the receptor is a single protein. And once it binds to the ligand during that binding, the dimer is formed. So this was something uh, new that we have added uh, with respect to the plants. 
So, uh, so any anyway, uh, as this was happening, this was again very focused study on the genes, and as I have told you, that uh, the landscape of the funding and the studies overall was changing towards the genomics. So we lost our funding, and then for one year I was uh, working as a lecturer in the Department of Plant Breeding and Genetics and teaching two courses. Uh, and then applying also for the jobs. And as we see that, you know, many plant genome got sequenced, so Arabidopsis was sequenced, rice was sequenced by that time, and there was much more sequencing that was happening for the other plant species. Uh, this is the, the sequencing of the strawberry and eucalyptus genome project where I also participated and co-authored these papers. Uh, so this was the time when technology changed. We had the shotgun sequencing technology emerging and sequencing became more economic or, uh, or rapid and fast. And, and so, you know, this was the new now. We are entering into the new era of uh, transcriptomics and genomics and so on. So from 2008 to 2012, uh, my shift was from uh, genetics and molecular biology and biochemistry to more into genomics and transcriptomics. And uh, also it became, uh, you know, unavoidable to learn uh, some of the bioinformatics and then eventually I came into biocuration as well. So in 2008, after uh, coming to Oregon State, I had to reinvent myself and here from the experimental biology biologist, I became more as a bioinformatic uh, scientist and a biocurator. So uh, so I, I thought that I had a great uh, advantage uh, of understanding in detail various methods uh, uh, about the gene-gene interactions, also about the pathways, about the biochemistry, about the plant development. And all that helped me to connect different dots uh, and also to skillfully mine the literature, to understand, to grab all the uh, needed evidence code, uh, to learn more about the gene ontology and uh, go and uh, plant ontology and so on. So I started connecting those dots, organizing that data, and this time not in the file maker, but more into the structure of the databases and initially the relational databases and later on, uh, now we work in the Neo4j uh, graph module. So continuously we see that not only the, uh, the content is changing, but also uh, the uh, outpour uh, of data is a direct result of the change in the technology. And so technology for the data generation is changing, but also for algorithms and the software and the data organization protocols and database structures, they also are in parallel in progress. And so, so these are like the two parallel races that are happening at the front of the uh, plant genomics and other genomics uh, areas. So, uh, so the first thing I started looking into uh, was to curate a database for the grape uh, and we created Vitisyc. I didn't have much funding and ac actually no dedicated funding. Uh, my initial appointment at Oregon State was for teaching, uh, but then I started working with the undergraduate students and volunteered my time to cu curate uh, two databases. So one was Vitisyc. So uh, uh, my undergraduate uh, student, Eli Waddell, he put about two years in helping to curate this database, and we published this in 2014. We also did uh, another database with another student, Christina Partipilo, and we also published the Fragaria site that was for the deployed strawberry. And before uh, create, uh, and so this was also created as a collaborative effort with the sequencing of the deployed strawberry genome with Kevin Folta. So these were my initial two plant metabolic databases that I have curated. And I have also contributed to MACE database later on. 
So, so now uh, a lot of things started happening now, more data and more data and different type of data, not only the sequence data, but we had a lot of data now from proteomics and metabolomics, and we had a lot of predictive uh, softwares. Uh, we had also the protein localization, high throughput, East, East and Co IP uh, interaction data. So we had a lot of different type of data. And so we thought that uh, moving to a new model of pathway curation and visualizing the gene network. So in uh, 2012, uh, while we were working on the biopsych pathway and biopsych platform, we also started experimenting with the reactome platform and we adopted reactome platform for doing the plant reactome. And so it had a lot of advantages where we can uh, put enormous number of nodes and also the new data type. So here we were not limited by metabolic pathways, but we were also able to uh, add the hormone signaling pathways. We were able to do the developmental processes or plant stress response or gene regulatory network within the reactome model and expand uh, various processes and genes uh, in this model. And so currently I am the lead curator for plant reactome database. And we use the rice as a reference species and do the computational projections based on gene orthology to another 129 uh, plant species. So we have pathway data for about 130 plant species. This is a free and open access uh, database and we implement the FEAR uh, data policy So, so this is the home page of plant reactome. And so here are the stats. So it is ongoing project. Uh, we are far from being completed. Uh, so, so far we have, you know, close to uh, 330 pathways that have been curated in rice and then projected to the other species. Uh, and uh, we manually curate the rice reference pathways uh, and then project on the other. We also provide tools uh, for displaying uh, basal gene expression data from the EMBL uh, plant gene atlas. And we have also ability to connect to the Uniprot. We have ability to connect to the um, metabolite databases. We have ability to uh, also upload the interactome data set and so on. So we closely collaborate with all other public databases, including Uniprot and Gramming Genes, Plant Sample, and so on. So, uh, and, and as you can see that we curate the data in the subcellular context of the eukaryotic cell. And uh, users can upload data and they can analyze their proteomic data, metabolome data, or gene expression data for pathway enrichment analysis and can make sense of their data. And especially in plants, we have large uh, gene families. We have multiple genes that have the same Go annotation. And so such analysis actually can help to differentiate which genes are expressing in response to a particular condition or in a particular organ or tissue or cell type. And one can choose the candidate genes out of many uh, many different family members. So, so we provide this tool to all the researchers and we provide also the tutorial. They are available in Grameen uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we also help uh, if somebody has any problem so they can write to us. Uh, this output can also be downloaded in tabulated form and one can move from one pathway to another pathway and visualize their data in the context of uh, pathways. So uh, I just wanted to talk about what limitation do we face for pathway biocuration. And uh, so the questions that Sue has asked, so I try to answer some of these questions here. So one, uh, so here is the example. The first thing is that we don't have enough gene functional annotation available. So this is the Arabidopsis model plant. And it is about now going to be uh, 24 years. Uh, and in these 24 years, as you can see that, not all the genes have a good functional annotation. So what we have here, we have uh, Go annotation uh, for 
majority of the genes in three categories if you combine. But then still there is a large portion of genes that, that are unknown and they have no go annotation as such. So, so first of uh, all, we do have the lack of uh, gene annotation. And so this is the recent publication from TIR. Uh, the similar situation is for the rice genome. And we have you know, less than 5,000 genes that have functional annotation. And large proportion is still unknown uh, function and have no go annotation as well. So I think the one limit is the uh, availability of the functional gene annotation and any connection uh, to pathways or processes. And so it is also due to the lack of data, but it is also lack of the curation effort. And so overall, the funding for the biocurators and manual curators is very, very low, and it has gone down since 2012. Uh, and uh, so a lot of literature is there, but nobody is able to connect all that. We, have, we are very limited in terms of uh, biocurators' capacity to read papers and link those. So many databases, uh, like many other databases, we looked for the solution. So one solution we looked into if we can engage the plant community uh, in curation of the data. Uh, and we had two uh, community pathway curation jamboree. I had also another last year with a graduate student in the Cold Spring Harbor. I had a couple at Oregon State University. Uh, but we have not been very uh, successful in getting and engaging the community curators in long term. Everybody is very busy and, you know, uh, so it is very hard to have the consistent uh, something productive coming from the community curator curators. Uh, the uh, second aspect we thought maybe we can involve undergraduate student and teach them by curation and maybe, you know, distribute the different tasks and they can benefit. And so this on this front, we had a lot of success. So I had worked so far with the 28 uh, undergraduate students. Uh, they worked on, uh, of course, initially Eli and Christina on Fregaria Psych and Whitey Psych. But then later on, many other biocurators, uh, undergraduate students, they worked on the plant reactome. And so every year I have five or six students who work on the gene functional improvement. We read the papers together, extract information. Uh, we do the little annotation, in, including the gene ID check, uh, connecting different dots, checking for the subcellular localization, making the gene summaries and so on. So all these biocurators, they do a great job and uh, you know they present their poster and they are funded mostly by the Oregon State University undergraduate research program, URSA, so I don't have to pay them. Uh, and then some of them who continue as a honors uh, thesis student, they continue to work with me for another one year or two year. Uh, some of them use also other mechanism uh, that are uh, for the research credits or uh, experiential learning activity. And uh, so, so a lot of work is coming from these uh, young people, uh, undergraduate, our undergraduate curators. So I'm very proud of them. Uh, and so far, I think we have uh, curated more than thousand genes together uh, with good functional summaries and you know, good uh, connections to the, uh, all, all the information that is needed. So, uh, so these are the three undergraduate students who worked with me this year, and they worked on the gravitropic, uh, gravitropism related pathways. And they also presented their work. So, so that was about the uh, limitation of the biocurators. Now I'd like to also say that there is also limitation of the functional studies uh, for each gene. And so we thought, what can we do? And so we try to reuse the uh, publicly available transcriptome data. Uh, if we can reanalyze that, if we could reuse that, if we can use this information uh, to improve the gene functional annotation, to uh, mine the gene-gene interaction uh, based on the co-expression pattern, at least have that as one of the evidence. If we can look into the promoter, 
sequences and find the signature for particular transcription factors. And that way we can have co-expression presence of the TF binding site, uh, some of the uh, studies that are published on the you know, promoter binding studies uh, and subcellular location and so on. So if we can put together more than one type of evidence and rate that, we can uh, at least create some of the gene networks. So we have been successful in doing that. And so this is one of the manuscripts we published last year. And we published in very much detail in a hope that other people can follow that, uh, that what a great resource is the transcriptome data that is publicly available uh, for uh, uh, harnessing uh, new information, asking new questions. And one of the person, our community curator, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Mohanty, she has been a great help and very engaged. And, you know, her contribution is tremendous in this paper as well. So, yes, we, we do have some of the very good community curators who, uh, who helped us. And we, we are very proud to share this publication with them. The other thing uh, we thought we can use this uh, transcriptome data is to again, uh, improve the gene functional annotation. And especially in case of the plants, they are polyploid. And we have a huge gene families ranging from hundreds to thousands of members. And they all have the same Go annotation. So it doesn't help us to understand the function of the each individual gene. And so we used uh, some of the transcriptome data to further associate uh, the expression pattern of uh, individual members of a gene family uh, with pathways, with the stress response, with the tissue differentiation, with the uh, cell-specific uh, expression, and so on. And so we, we think that there is another opportunity to improve the gene family members' functional annotation using the, uh, using the transcriptome data. So, so this this work was done with a great help from the Damon Dykeman, who was an honors thesis student in my lab, and he worked almost for two and a half years, and we were able to characterize 140 genes of one of the family uh, that from the rice, the S domain kinase superfamily. So now, uh, just I take a break, and then we say, okay, why do we do biocuration? And so one of the, you know, the first thing is that I give this example. Uh, this is a curation done by the, a museum curator uh, in the, uh, in one of the botanic garden uh, in DC. And this is a very simple pictorial example. Why do we do biocuration? Because we want uh, a knowledge synthesis for easy comprehension. So we can communicate very easily the complex facts uh, without much of the technical jargon and make it uh, understandable. The other, so these are like the two very good examples that I can say, and it is good for educators, it is good for the researchers, it's good for everybody, for policymakers, if we have to say why to do biocuration. Uh, the second aspect, uh, when we do biocuration, then we think, okay, we do biocuration because we like to support uh, the uh, translation of the science. We like to support the breeders. We like to support the scientists who are working on making the agriculture system climate res resilient and also increasing the agriculture productivity. Can we help them? Can we help them identify the candidate genes and pathways? Can we help them uh, to switch the uh, you know, um, uh, some of the metabolic energy in a given place to improve the quality, the improve the quantity of certain metabolites or certain nutrients and have more uh, nutritive crops. And so when we think about these two things, first making things easy to understand and then second to support the scientists for making better crops, uh, this provides us a focus to prioritize which pathway to curate, because otherwise it is endless literature, and so we target one at a time. And this is our guiding guiding light when we pick the pathways and papers for biocuration. 
so uh, so the another aspect is that uh, I am still a uh, biocurator, but I interact a lot with the experimental scientists, uh, typically in uh, genomics community, but also with the rice researchers, with the grape researcher and the strawberry research community. And uh, I understand by talking to them what is needed, which are the critical problems. And, you know, I go to the field uh, trips in most conferences and I, I see what is important and how it is being translated. So it really keeps us into ground what is important and how uh, we can help and where our role fits in, in all that. So, uh, so this I cannot do alone. And uh, and as a database also, we cannot do alone. And so I think the another community that we uh, are very connected to and we admire and we get inspired is the community of the biocurators. So ISP is, uh, you know, one of the uh, great community. And I am very inspired from all great biocurators uh, over the year to see their work, to share our protocols to share some of the uh, uh, standards to learn from them. And so I'm very, very thankful. And, uh, you know, I keep learning uh, different things from different people and uh, getting inspired. So the other uh, community of the curators and database fo folks that I am very closely uh, related to is the egg biodata community. And here we share the protocols. We also highlight the problems. We also review what is needed, what is not needed, and we work together. So this is one of the white paper we published last year, looking into what are the barriers in connecting genotype to phenotype data, uh, what are the standards for the data, annotation, metadata, where it is lacking. And we made a full list of a very, very long list of the resources worldwide that are available and where they fall in meeting various standards. And, and where we lack, uh, what is needed to be, what kind of the repositories are not there yet for the phenotype data and yet for the images and so on. Uh, and so, so this was the paper that has all the details and uh, a review of the, with the great effort in another 12 uh, members of this working group. Uh, so, so some of the common challenges that we have identified is that uh, that are barrier uh, in comprehending the full utility of the uh, uh, plant genomes. Uh, so one thing is that, of course, there is a lack of data collection, but there is also lack of sharing, and there are also access issues around the data. We also identified still some issues about the data interoperability and data integration. And then limited, one of the bottleneck is the limited data visualization and analysis tools for the genomics data. And of course, limited funding for the manual bi biocuration by experts. And not yet, uh, very, we don't yet have any mature AI-based, uh, you know, LLM-based methods that can replace completely the biocuration. So we, we lack on both front, uh, both at the AI front uh, and also at the funding that is available for the manual biocuration. So uh, the other thing, uh, what I see, at least in the plants, is that we need uh, more uh, biocuration that can connect genotype, phenotype, and environment. And so here we have a good repository and good system for doing the genotype. We have a few standards uh, about the phenotype. The relationship between uh, all three components, genotype, phenotype, and environment, is not very well established. We don't have the repository for the images. Uh, and then unless you know we have all three components, we cannot address the climate change the effect of the biotic and the abiotic stress and so on. So I keep, so on the uh, other side, I keep doing some experiments uh, and it kind of, you know, uh, brings again, uh, brings the issues that, you know, what we are lacking and, you know, how we 
uh, should define the standards for the data, also for the metadata and uh, repositories and so on. So my connection still to the doing some experiments, not a lot, uh, also helped me to understand what the researchers need and talking to other researchers. So the other uh, thing I like to actually thank uh, two, two individuals who, who helped me a lot in my uh, career in understanding the plant processes. And they, they are not my formal mentors, but in kind of, a, you know, informal mentors. So one is Professor Govinji, also known as Mr. Photosynthesis. Uh, he is the one who discovered the various reactions of photosynthesis, the light reactions, oxygen evolving complex, and so on. And here I visited him last year in Illinois. Uh, and uh, and he has planted this tree in memory of Robert Emerson. And so we are standing here. So it is a great connection with the photosynthesis community that I cherish. And again, I also like to thank uh, Professor Sujan Makuch. So she has been the mentor to my husband, Pankaj Jaiswal, and also the first PI of the Grameen database that uh, plant reactome later became a part. And so a lot of uh, inspiration I also uh, get from her. So I like to thank both of them. Uh, then I, uh, over the years, I understood who I am. So of course, I am a scientist, but I am also a human being who has traveled from one continent to another continent. I am a woman. Uh, and so... I have uh, a lot of barriers uh, in becoming a scientist, in becoming a biocurator, but I also have a lot of privileges. And I just like to uh, uh, list some of those here. Uh, I'm also a person of color, but I'm also competent uh, and I can move across cultures. Uh, I am also a first generation college student in my family. Uh, but I'm also now a professor, so I have both my barriers and I have my privileges, like all of us. And I think uh, especially the DEI initiative of ISP is, you know, worth applauding. And I highly appreciate the ISP for keeping that uh, issue always alive, putting a lot of work, uh, being inclusive, inclusive. Uh, getting people from diverse uh, experiences, diverse backgrounds uh, to be involved and encouraged. Uh, so I think that is one reason I like ISP very much. I have served in past in the DEI committee. And so I like to say that people who are new and younger, uh, please you know join it uh, if you have time. And uh, it is a great place to contribute and to uh, and we can all benefit from your experience uh, that you bring with you from different domains of life and different geography and different life experiences. So uh, now I think, you know, I'm a person uh, who has, again, limited experience. And so I do have, like everybody, some faults. And I also make mistakes. I'm also blind on certain things. Uh, but my hope is that together we can create a safe space for learning and discovery for everyone. And I like to thank all my collaborators uh, at Oregon State University. Uh, I work very closely with Justin Elser, Paril Gupta, and Pankaj Jaiswal in plant reactome project and also on other genome projects. Uh, I also work with very closely with Doreen Beer from Cold Spring Harbor and her team. And Peter uh, Distachio is our mentor uh, for biocuration. Uh, he's from the Human Reactome Project. Uh, and we also like to thank the Human Reactome Project uh, and the PI Lincoln Stein and other uh, folks there for helping us. We use their uh, system. We get trained from them, training from them as needed, and a lot of support from the Human Reactome Project. We also like to acknowledge uh, funding from the NASA Gene Lab and also from the EMBL, uh, all the data users, data generators, and the community members, uh, and Egg Data and ISP, the two, two, two societies 
to so ISBS Society Egg Biodata is a consortium. And all the undergraduate students, community curators like Vijay Lakshmi Mohanty, uh, and, and so on. And so I guess I am good here, uh, good here for the questions. I didn't see one in the chat yet, so maybe I can start you off. Um, yeah. I think we met in 2011, sorry, 2021 or 2022, like during the pandemic, and we were doing these virtual conferences. And I remember that we had Peter Karp join for one of these panels. I think you were on that panel. And part of the discussion was how to coordinate all of these big databases that are all kind of with similar directions. How do we consolidate them? I remember I personally was very against the idea of consolidating all these databases because it meant that nobody would get to get credit for the stuff that they did. And, and we've talked a lot about different parts of that in the last couple of years. I'm wondering how you feel like the the future of, you know, the whole plant reactome project and, and some of the other things you did, right? You had a lot of different kinds of people participating at different levels. How do you give them all credit? And uh, and how do you think that your efforts from from one institution fit into a, a larger sort of more strategic plan. I I think we uh, I I think uh, merging everything together is not a feasible idea because of the volume and because of the specialized type of the curation and need for the community. Uh, but I think it is okay and it is it should be that we should not duplicate efforts, and we should be able to hyperlink and connect. And, to the related resources. So for example, in plant reactome, we don't do the protein curation. What we do, we link to, uh, so we have the protein ID. And if you click on the protein ID, you go to Uniprot database. And so we are not duplicating, we are not bringing their data, but asking users just in a very seamless way to go and find more information from protein. Same thing we do for the PubCam. Uh, same thing we do for the gene ID and gene related information. And so we link. And so so then it it is not like up to us that whom to acknowledge. We are sending the users to the other database. And, uh, and, and there is no reason why we should duplicate that information that is already there. Because so, so little information. We have only one curator in plant reactome fund funding. We have one maybe in the Uniprot for the plant. Uh, maybe we have one in the plant ensemble. So we don't have many people. Anytime we do the gene functional uh, improvement uh, or annotation, I send that file to the RepDB for the RISE genes and they upload it. They have also one curator. And so when it is updated, then Uniprot can pick it and then ensemble gene can pick it from there. And so I think the collaboration is needed. We don't need to duplicate and bring things and everybody has their own credit, own uh, way to justify the funding, have their own papers. So, so this is how I see it. Yeah, good, thanks. Any other questions, chat, audience? I just want to thank you, Sashma. That was a great talk. Um, sort of thinking about the questions I, I'd asked earlier of the biggest challenges with the data. It sounds like, and I, I was wondering if you had a feel for how much of the, the absence of data is the data is not there and how much of the absence of data is you just don't have the resources to curate it. Like, do you have any idea of how big of the backlog of data out there that is, if you had the funding, the data is there and you could curate it versus the data is just not there? Yeah, I, I think uh, I don't have the exact number, but I think uh, altogether we have close to, let's say, close to 20% genes in plants that have some level of curation if we put together all the efforts from the tier, from the rice people, Arabidopsis people, MedGDB, uh, from the uh, Rice Genome Project, 
maybe 25% is curated and a lot of it is curated uh, by manual bio-curation. And suddenly, as you see that the funding for tier also later for the Grammy in 2020 fell, that manual curation has suffered to a great deal. And, and, and so whatever projection we have that is based on gene orthology based projection on any organism that is coming from a good cur curation that the tier has done or the gramine has done initially or MGDB has done some of it. Uh, so, so, I, so I think uh, uh, the number of the papers, if you look into on the functional genomics or on Arabidopsis or rice, they are increasing every year. So I think still uh, perhaps another to, if there is a funding for five years uh, good for manual bio curation perhaps we can improve that gold standard data set that we say the manually curated one to 50 percent and uh, everybody will benefit not only people from arabidopsis or rice or some model organism but uh, you know for all the plant species i can see thank you Okay, I think that's it for for questions. Um, we'll we'll send along the links to all of the presentations and the YouTube video of everything in case people want to look back at what we saw. Uh, big thanks again to Victoria and Sushma, and congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And I'll just leave it uh, if Sue has any parting remarks before we finish up. Well, um. I just really want to thank everybody again for coming today. Um, really appreciate that you are, you know, participating in the society and supporting each other. Um, and yes, we're generally looking for, you know, as much more interaction as we can get with everyone. Um, so I really feel like this is a, a great opportunity for us. Um, and I guess on, on the AI note that Sushma brought up, I, I know that there's a lot of interest in that. And we definitely have some workshops at the upcoming 2025 meeting to try to discuss that. Because I think we are all, all of us struggling with how do we bring AI in and, and how do we actually meet the promise or, or if we can't meet the promise, uh, reduce the expectations of funding. To try to try to say, all right, here's the reality. Um, and I think that's a large part of what we do is saying, here's the reality. And, and we have to try to all work together to make that a better way. And so, again, just thank everybody. Uh, one last clap for our award winners. Um, and we'll we'll end early. We're efficient. Good job, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all.